Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for being here. My name is Sabina Sheck, and I'm here um, on behalf of SIGU, uh, the Committee on Environment, Geography, and Urbanization. Just a quick word about, about SIGU. Um, we're one of the sponsors for tonight, along with um, other groups that uh, my colleague will mention to you. Uh, but SIGU is an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary platform on research, teaching, and engaged public events like this one. We're focused on the societal and spatial dimensions of environmental transformation. Um, SIGU has a thriving undergraduate major and a student magazine, um, a PhD certificate. So a lot of our students are here. Thank you for coming. And a robust series of public events. We have another event next week and um, a lot more on our website. So definitely join us for those other events. Um, I'm super excited about the conversation to come, but I'm not going to say more about it because we're soon going to hear from my colleague, uh, Jennifer Scapatoni, who is the visionary behind the geopoetics of urban rivers. And before that, though, I'm very honored to introduce Becky Lyons, who is the Director of Equity and Engagement for Friends of the Chicago River, who will give us some quick opening remarks. Thanks, Becky. Right. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm so honored to be here tonight. So thank you so much to Jennifer and um, to Sabina and the University of Chicago team for for letting me sort of kick us off today. Um, so uh, as Sabina said, my name is Becky. I work for Friends of the Chicago River. If you haven't heard of Friends, um, we were founded in 1979. And our mission is to protect and restore the Chicago Calumet River system for all people, water and for wildlife. But I wanted to sort of ground us today, kind of looking a little further back to how sort of we got here, how our river system got a bit to where it is today. And I'm sure our speakers will go way into more of that. But to give us a little background, um, because we are in this unique place in Chicago, we've got our Great Lakes here, and then we also have our rivers, connection to the Mississippi River. Chicago has always been, this region has always been a central place for cultural exchange, for trade, for connection and care among so many native tribes that, um, that utilized and lived in this region. Oh, that's not mine. Um, but since co colonization and industrialization, our rivers have been manipulated, they've been channelized, they've been reversed. These two different watersheds have been uh, artificially sewn together. And so we really treated um, these spaces no longer as natural spaces, but as highways and dumping grounds for capital. And so we that really got pushed and pushed our environments to the limits for over a century. And so in the 1960s and 70s, we all know there was so much activism on so many different fronts, but that includes sort of the environment and public health. There was really this growing sort of cultural understanding of how industries were harming us, how they were harming our environment and humans and all of that sort of interconnectedness. And that was really how... Um, this change was born of people getting together um, to form friends, but also to form you know, people for community recovery on the Calumet River, um, categorizing all the landfills and toxic waste sites that were surrounding the river there. So really this is kind of where all these efforts came from to really change the river. And so we've really been um, working since then us and so many community organizations um, to reclaim the Chicago River, the Calumet River, all of the connections and the tributaries bet in between as rivers, as spaces that are central to public and community health um, and to climate resiliency as we face heavier um, and more frequent rainstorms as climate change exacerbates. And it's especially important in disinvested communities, so many of whom were, have been cut off from the river by these industrial sites and operations. So we're really looking now to embrace that nature is not separate from humans. It's not separate from cities, right? A river is central to our city and be something that we all have access to and can build that connection with. And I do want to celebrate, we really have improved our river so much since the 70s, like it's important to remember that in the 70s, there were only 10 species of fish that could survive in the river because it was so polluted. And now there's over 70 species. So just that alone and like all of the wildlife we see there today on all of our rivers shows like it's really improved so much and we have a long way to go. And so we're going to talk more about that tonight. You're going to hear more about it, I'm sure. And so as we push forward, we're really looking to discussions like this, conversations and spaces like this, to what communities are advocating for and asking for, um, and what cities around the world are doing, like Paris, um, to figure out how we can push forward and how we work together towards a healthy and climate resilient ecosystem with open, equitable access for all. 
So that's me. And I'm going to pass it over to Jennifer Scappagione. Thanks, Becky and Sabina. Um, my name is Jennifer. I work in the English, Romance, Language, and Literature um, and Creative Writing programs, as well as being a faculty affiliate in SIGU and in the Center for the Center of Gender and Sexuality. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that as the mural by Ojibwe artist Andrea Carlson along the main branch of the river puts it, the Chicago River puts it, Bodawad Mikik et the Yayak, you are on Potawatomi land when you traverse the banks of that powerful and spectacular channel. You are as well amidst Potawatomi, Potawatomi waters. Other indigenous peoples that have lived in these wetlands include the Ojibwe and Odawa, as well as the Ho-Chunk, Kickapoo, Miami, Menominee, Peoria, Sauk, and Meskwaki. And we are grateful for their stewardship of this terrestrial, aquatic, and aerial place where we convene as guests in the shadow of forced removal and genocide. Today, Chicago is home to the largest urban indigenous population in the Midwest, which continues to honor and steward this place and its waterways. In thinking critically about the geographic forces of this city and their planetary extensions, our cycle of discussions hopes to honor this actuality and to trouble the settler perspective at the heart of urban discourse. This symposium devoted to the geopoetics of urban rivers will unfold this year across the watersheds of Chicago and Paris. It began as a provocation. Both Paris and our aspiring Paris on the Prairie were modeled according to assumptions about the power of design to domesticate landscape. We are prone in comparing the two to cite the influence of the architects of Louis XIV, Napoleon Bonaparte, Napoleon III, and Osman on Daniel Burnham's radiating boulevard cuts for his projected city beautiful of symmetries. Such a comparative imaginary with its imposing, immediately graspable, easily translatable rationalist geometry hardly conflicts with Robert Herrick's 1898 declaration that the city of Chicago was made of man, brazen, unequal, like all man's works. It stands a stupendous piece of blasphemy against nature. Both metropolises reward a Cartesian gaze that regards their designs from avenues to parks in terms of urban morphology. But how do the legacies of these illustrious urban plans resound in a new millennium whose confluence of crises insists that we outstrip an arrogantly anthropocentric point of view to contend with the fact that landscape is an agent and a relation, not a neutral medium? Once we look past the theatrics of monumental backdrops and tactical vistas such as were on display in the Olympic opening ceremonies, these metropolises demand apprehension as drivers of circulatory systems wrangling to manage the input and output of vessels that have been subject to elaborate channeling, yet which repeatedly, sometimes spectacularly, inundate anthropogenic design, the rivers and interwoven watersheds and rains responsible for these metropoles' strategic bearings in the first place. Cities demand to be sensed in fluid terms as digestive systems and ecologies lacking boundary lines, rebutting Osman's realization of the imperial dictum that Paris is centralization itself opening their streets to light and air in hygienic style, modern planners also had to contend with great quantities of moisture with river crossings and keys, traffic and sanitation. Osman used bodily metaphors in construing the galleries he would renovate for water and sewage as functioning like an organ without seeing the light of day. Below the city, fresh water, light and heat circulate and 
the secretions are taken away mysteriously without spoiling its beautiful exterior. Ingress and egress of these urban secretions are no longer invisible or imperceptible, however, and call to be demystified. Having gone to great lengths to engineer the flushing of sewage, having reaped the noxious fruits of zealous dumping, both Chicago and Paris administer gargantuan efforts of water treatment. Both face vast infrastructural challenges to bring back species, from river otters to sturgeon to the least bittern, and seek histrionically to present their river waters as swimmable by citizens. The thinkers we have before us tonight, Rachel Haverlock and Dilip de Cunha, will recast the way we think about the river as form. They recognize that the very act of declaring a division between water and terrain is an ideological and to a great extent infelicitous act. Reading their works, we apprehend that the separation of land from the chaos of waters in Genesis is a primary act of Western territorialization. This transdisciplinary symposium, which will continue with floating workshops on the rivers Chicago and Seine, links humanists with geographers, designers, scientists, artists, and activists to remap our cities through the watersheds that link fetishized urban masses to the rest of the planet. It posits that the perspectives of the humanities and arts are crucial to maintaining a vision of the city as planetary immersion apprehensible at sporadic sites of rupture or deluge. It contends that creative practice can open up genuinely new thinking about ecology. It responds to Angela Last's call for the undoing of geopolitics through geopoetics, learning from the cyclone imagination of thinkers like Guadalupian Danielle Maximin, rejecting the fantasy of mastery, stability, and control that shapes classical Western geography and geopolitics. I need to acknowledge here the sponsors that made this dare possible, beginning with the International Institute of Research in Paris and the Villa Albertine, and extending to the CNRS with its new International Research Lab, Humanities Plus, and the Université Gustave Eiffel, as well as the Frankie Institute for the Humanities, the Department of English, and the Committee on Environment, Geography, and Urbanization. I thank in particular those whose collaboration and enthusiasm were fundamental to this project over the past year in the face of administrative cuts and losses. Sabina Sheck and Carlo Diaz of SIGU, as well as the entire staff and Adriana Chiapas, V. Bani, Lou Gargori, and Olivier Brossard. <clears throat> Off-campus entities with whom we were delighted to partner include Urban Rivers, the Shedd Aquarium, the Chicago Maritime Museum, Friends of the Chicago River, UIC's Freshwater Lab, and the Narrow Bridge Arts Club. I am excited to introduce our keynote speakers, whose role in reworking the conception of what a river is made them without question the ideal keynotes for this project. Through Rachel Haverlock, I have learned to regard the Chicago River as a publicly funded oil pipeline. Through Dilip de Cunha, I have learned to question the construct of the river as itself a colonial imposition. And yet, we will see that their work is equally informed by on-the-ground grappling with the infrastructural realities of flood, drought, pollution, and political conflict all while attending to how discourse and design defines material realities. Rachel Haverlock joins us from the University of Illinois at Chicago, where she is professor of English and director of the Freshwater Lab, an environmental humanities initiative focused on the North American Great Lakes and environmental justice. The Freshwater Lab communicates Great Lakes water issues to the general public through storytelling and mentors a new generation of Great Lakes leaders while reaching outward to build relationships with water stewards from other parts of the world.
Rachel's decade of work toward her first book called Stories About the Jordan River from Religious Traditions and Lived Experience in a Politically Contested Valley that Drew on the Water as a Border. This led her not only to author River Jordan, the mythology of a dividing line, um, which is an academic monograph, but also to write and direct the hip hop play from Tel Aviv to Ramallah staged across the world and to join the International Advisory Council of the NGO EcoPeace Middle East that brings inhabitants of the region together around water sources, both shared and dwindling. Rachel is also author of the related 2020 study, The Joshua Generation, Israeli Occupation and the Bible. Dilip Dacunya is an architect and planner based in Philadelphia and Bangalore and teaches at Columbia. He is author with Anuradha Mathur of Mississippi Floods, Designing a Shifting Landscape, Deccan Traverses, The Making of Bangalore's Terrain, Soak, Mumbai in an Estuary, and editor of Design in the Terrain of Water. With Anu Mathur, Dacunya created a design platform that enables us to visualize habitation in ubiquitous wetness. It's called Ocean of Wetness. His recent study, The Invention of Rivers, Alexander's Eye and Ganga's Descent, explores the production of the river as a fair weather, disembodied, and fundamentally specious construct whose governing lines correspondingly create the grounds for colonization and the crisis imaginary associated with places of rain, perpetuating a territorial battle against water. His various awards have included a Pew Fellowship, a Rome Prize, and a Guggenheim. Our speakers will be engaged in conversation by moderator Aaron Jakes, who is a professor of modern Middle Eastern history and SIGU, currently working on a new project titled Tilted Waters, the World the Suez Canal Made. We will open the discussion to questions before we close. For now, please help me welcome them all. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Jennifer, and thank you, Sabina, particularly for inviting me and for inviting me to share the podium with uh, with Rachel here and uh, and Aaron. I look forward to it very much. I'm going to read because uh, I mean I I don't generally read. I meander, I guess, but uh, um, but I'm going to read because I have a time limit. You know, it'll keep, keep me to a channel. <laughs> yeah. So I hope to convince you today, I hope to convince you today not to look at Chicago and Sen, but to look for them. Now, in all our work, when we hear the name, hear a name, we wonder if it alludes to what we are taught it, we are taught to see or to something else. So is Mississippi, can we lower the lights a little bit? Um, is Mississippi a river or the rising and falling wetness? Is Bangalore a city or an intersection of enterprises? Is Bombay an island or an estuary? Is Ganges a river or rain? Is India a geographic surface or an ocean of rain? I would like to ask the same of Chicago and Sen. Are they rivers or are they something else? The fact is that rivers are products of design, not in their engineering or beautification, but in their creation. They are created not from nothing, but from something with four design devices, or maybe, you know, what can be called 
weapons of colonization. The geometric surface, the geometric line, the hydrologic cycle, and the language of landscape. The question is created from what? Our answer is wetness. Wetness is ubiquitous. It is in the air, flora, fauna. It is precipitating, seeping, soaking, osmoting, evaporating, transpiring. It's in the air, it's in air, it's in soil, and flora and fauna. We live in wetness. We participate in it as wetness ourselves. This wetness is Oceanus, a name that does not refer to a geographic ocean out there, but to the ocean in which we live. This is a planet that an astronaut never leaves, even when they claim to see a planet from 30,000 miles away, because wetness is in their eyes. Eyes that, if not wet, would be dead. Yet, we are not taught that we live in ocean. Certainly, the astronauts don't seem to embrace the idea. We are taught that we live on a surface of a planet that textbooks tell us is 70% water and 30% land. But anybody with an ounce of sense knows it is 100% land with water in its service. Water that supplies and drains land, shapes and improves it, provides it with energy, transport, and today with waterfronts. So it seems that we inhabit two planets, one an ocean of wetness that we are born into and live in, the other an earth that we learn to live on. In one, we are hydrologic insiders. In the other, we are geographic outsiders. In one, our experience is immersive. In the other, it is objective and extractive. It may explain, it may explain what the anthropologist Brian Fagan describes as the clash of cultures that followed colonization by European powers as a clash of planets, a clash of two languages of place, a clash between hydrologic insiders and geographic outsiders. It may also explain the chaos in the monsoon and hurricane belts of the world where Earth sits most uncomfortably and tragically. Do we all live this clash, each of us speaking two languages of place that we pass as formal and informal, some doing it with agility, some with stress, others with confusion, and yet others a sense of oppression? More importantly, are we witnessing the ongoing design of Earth in ocean? a design project exposed in its failings by climate change. It would be fair then to say that these are not problems to solve. They are consequences of a design project that creates the earth. Let us review this project. If nothing, to open the possibility of Chicago and Sen, another possibility for Chicago and Sen. This project begins with the laying down of a geometric surface. How do you put a surface down in an ocean of wetness? In an ocean of wetness, it's like putting it's like putting a surface down on Jupiter, a gas giant. I'm sorry, I'm losing my eyesight here. Um, 
but up close where do you put it where do you put the surface down it may seem easy from a distance but not from close so where do you put it or wherever you put it it divides wetness above from wetness below it is the first act of any surveyor they decide whether the ant hill the tree the marsh or for that matter mist and clouds are below and as such part of planet earth or above and as such occupants of the earth i mean you must remember i mean as marjorie nicholson writes you know in her book uh, mountain gloom mountain glory even mountains until the 17th century were seen as occupants of the earth unwelcome occupants of the earth so the decision whether to put them above or below but the surface they lay serves a serious purpose a ground of observation and habitation and a reference and a datum so they're doing an important task it is however a peculiar surface a surface that is a pure idea it's a geometric surface after all with length and breadth but no depth so a geometric element that you cannot experience i mean who can experience something with no depth at all you don't see it yeah it's something that you learn in a classroom or just believe to be proclus in the 5th century likened it to a shadow which he says does not go into the earth now the advantage of dividing anything is that you can then unite it on your terms colonizers know this all too well i mean divide and rule they deploy a surface to divide wetness but then close then choose to see it uniting two waters precipitation from above such as rain snow dew and waters and waters from below through springs and wells and so land is created land is created as a shadow that we consider belonging to the earth and a means by which we measure possess and colonize planet earth but also manipulate it to make water go where we want it to go to me it's a magnificent invention it works as a commons of commons a ground of comparison beyond critique a ground that indigenous people contort themselves to both embrace and refute today we talk of land as if it always existed it even features in definitions of colonialism the conquest and control of other people's land and goods the implanting of settlements on distant territory for a colonized people this is franz fanon you know, for a colonized people the most essential value because it is the most meaningful is first and foremost the land it assumes that all people are geographic outsiders so we have not one but two ways to receive rain one on earth that you see on your right where rivers fall to a surface form flows and run and runs to the sea the other in ocean on the left where rain soaks its way down holding saturating and exceeding only to be held again and again and again holding in the air soil plants and animals this planet is blotting material it refutes the map it beguiles the eye so water flows wetness holds nonetheless it is earth that we are programmed to live on a planet with a surface to which rain falls and flows inspiring drainage rather than holding infrastructures 
The second design device is a geometric line. With the surface in place, Earth is now ready to be inscribed, particularly after it is observed that water flows from high grounds to low grounds, the lowest being the sea. This time, it is a line that is deployed to divide. It divides a part drained from a part that does the draining. This is no ordinary line. This is a geometric line with only length and no breadth. So again, it is something that we do not experience, but learn in a classroom or just believe in. The surface, this line turns, I mean, this, the surface, I'm mean, like the surface, this line turns uniter of dry land and designated places of water, such as rivers, that can be now channeled, piped, dammed, divided, sent underground, or erased completely. So now we have not one, but two modes of habitation. One on land, which you see on the right, inscribed with lines, tasked with confining water to a place. Lines that we enforce with levees, walls, and an extensive infrastructure of dams, canals, and floodways. The other in, that you see on your left, the other inner ubiqu ubiquitous wetness that we occupy on gradients of less and more wet, high to low, not absolutes of land and water. It is likely how the Native Americans lived in the Mississippi. To them, the Mississippi was possibly a rising and falling wetness with no limits that you see on your left here. This is in the flood of 1927 when only two high grounds appeared above the waters. One were levees and the other was Indian mounds. It is Herod Herodotus tells us how the Egyptians lived in the Nile and Alexander's men tell us how Indians lived in the Indus, not on the banks of rivers. Herodotus describes Egypt as a world of mounds that appeared in summer like islands in the Aegean Sea. European settlers in America, however, chose not to live in an ocean of wetness called Mississippi that rises and falls in intensity, but on the banks of a river called Mississippi that flows and floods, and that is still flowing and still flooding to this day. And of course, we have chosen to follow the European settlers. Living in what I call a river literacy. Source is the start of a line, course is the flow of a line, and flood is the erasure of a line. It is a literacy that raises questions that we all should be asking. Wetness is everywhere. Why do we insist on seeing water somewhere? Precipitation falls everywhere. Why do we see rivers beginning in points? Flood is water crossing a line that is drawn. Why do we see flood as a natural event? Not only do we see flood as a natural event, we naturalize the time of a flood event as a flood pulse. And the space taken by water that escapes confinement as floodplain. We even speak of a flood ecosystem as a natural feature of Earth. I find the lack of critical thinking here absolutely appalling. Think of how many people who have lived and continue to live with rising and falling wetness have been displaced by the created fact of flood, crossing a line that has been intentionally drawn. Nonetheless, rivers dominate our imagination. The third device, the water cycle. 
Inscribing a line on Earth, on the Earth's surface, would not be possible without setting a time. Given that line, cannot, any line cannot be drawn in rain or if using satellite imagery when there are clouds. So a time of habitation is set by designing the hydrologic cycle. The movement of water through multiple states and, and, and places always with the possibility of returning to the same state and place. In its simplest form, drawn here by Paul Klee of the Bar House, water moves through four phases. Precipitation is number one, flow formation number two, evaporation and cloud formation. Now it is not surprising that the moment of flow formation is chosen to be the time in which we inhabit. It is when precipitation has stopped and evaporation and cloud formation yet to begin. A clear and calm moment when we can venture out to assign water a place on the Earth's surface, mark properties and design drainage infrastructure. By anchoring reality in this moment, we reduce the other three moments to ephemeralities. So rivers and other surface water bodies become residents while rain, snow, fog, cloud, dew become visitors, ephemeral presences. They are migrants that come and go in weather events that we create so as to make their visits predictable and keep out of our fair weather landscape with infrastructure, building design and disaster preparedness. So we have not one, but two times of habitation. One on Earth, on the right, that occupies a fair weather moment, which is when we can take control of the surface that we lay down, the Earth, the line that we draw, and the weather events that we predict. The second, on the left, inhabits the moment of precipitation, extended with what I call nested holdings, Holdings within holdings within holdings. Now to the fourth design device. With land drained and time set, Earth is ready to be articulated to speak the language of landscape. Emphasis on land. A language that celebrates land, enforces the subservience of water, and extracts and relates landscape elements as occupants of planet Earth. I refer to elements such as trees, animals, fishes, birds, seen here separated and extracted by Alexander Humboldt. Also to lakes, rivers, mountains, and waterfalls, separated, extracted, and compared by people in the 19th century who saw themselves as producers of useful knowledge. These elements are assembled to create places like these, places described as nature and studied for relationships, processes, and entanglements, often ironically with the assertion that they are inseparable. The same is done with crafted artifacts seen here in a painting by Thomas Daniels, assembled along with mountains and trees into places, some believable, some unbelievable, yet possible. It is often said that colonialism was fueled by the extraction of resources, but no one speaks of this extraction, carried out with an eye that separates in order to unite. It creates elements that can be manipulated at will. Think of the violence of this extraction. To create a river, for example, drawing two lines from source to sea is just the first step. It is followed by removing fish, algae, bacteria, plants, etc., all things that are considered inhabitants in their own right. Their removal cannot be easy, given that water courses through them as it, is, as, as it does through a river. But once removed, 
the object left behind meets the definition of a river as, quote, flowing water in a channel with defined banks. We learn to practice this act of violence. We learn to take it for granted early in life when we learn the alphabet. So now we have two languages of place. One is objective and extractive and universal on the right. The one on the left is a language, uh, that was the language of landscape that works through representation. The other on your left is nominal, immersive and particular, the language of wetness that operates through demonstration. I suspect that all of these devices surface line, cycle, and landscape have been deployed to create what we take for granted to be the Chicago River and the Seine. We have certainly found them at work in all the places that we have engaged. We found them in Lower Mississippi. We're following, we're following the arrival of European settlers. There has been a manic drive not to tame a lawless stream, as Mark Twain put it, but to create one. Our own explorations found a ubiquitous wetness that beguiled the eye in the mist and plants of fields and bayous, the rhythm of the Delta blues and much more. We found these four devices at work in Bombay, a place conceived by European colonizers as an island in the 1500s, separated from the sea with a firm line. The struggle to contain rain to drains here is evident every day, particularly in the monsoon. In our own explorations, we chose not to see an island drained to the sea, but an estuary in the monsoon. Here we found not rivers, but rain not land uses, but practices, not a drain imagination, but a soak imagination that we callously learn from school to label informal. It is, however, its own language of place, a place in ocean that locals call Mumbai. We found these devices at work in the Ganges as well an object that historians, geographers, ecologists, and administrators extract as a river that they declare to be a spine of civilization and drain of settlement, an element whose waters suffer the contradiction of being the most polluted and yet the most cleansing at the same time. To us, it speaks to the cognitive dissonance that comes with speaking two languages of place a language of landscape and a language of rain. So we chose to see not a river, but rain, a rain that introduces us to a world of nested holdings, so ubiquitous that locals describe it as a goddess, Ganga. How do you confine a goddess with two lines? This is one set of drawings in a part, in a really part of a much larger exhibition called Ocean of Rain. So I'm just giving you a glimpse, a really a, gl a glimpse. So this is a set, actually, of, of uh, in Varanasi. Now, I'm aware that the symposium is about urban rivers. Rivers, however, wherever they are, are urban creations. In fact, they are urbane creations, presented as makers of civilization. They seed a flow imagination and an infrastructure meant to fuel development and produce great wealth. So today, even if your place is not on a river, the river comes to you, as the river Kaveri does to Bangalore, through four pipes, across a distance of 100 miles, and up a 1,000 feet via three pumping stations. This is not a river that has been engineered into existence. This is the essence by which all rivers have been created. The river similarly comes to the Thar in Northwest India. It begins with wishful tentative lines in a place 
that James Reynolds in the 1700s described as parts, if you read this here, you know, parts very little known to Europeans. Parts that he labels a desert, from desertum, meaning left to waste, this despite millions of people who live here. Those tentative lines have become firm with water channeled from elsewhere that you see on your right there, making a river ready for urban development. We journeyed this so-called river and saw a world of holdings of rain, pastures of sheep, and grounds for dyers, flamingos, Siberian cranes, salt fields, and nomadic fairs. It is a world of wetness to which, whether we like it or not, the river is coming, bringing with it lucrative real estate and riverfront developments. In fact, it is raining riverfronts all over India now. They're really creating rivers because to have a riverfront, you have to have a river. So I will end by saying this with some confidence. Before the Chicago River was engineered or beautified and now being naturalized, a flow was created, it was separated, contained and calibrated with two lines. But before that flow was created with two lines, the time of habitation was set with a hydrologic cycle to a fair weather moment and a geometric surface was laid that we take to be land. However, before time was set and a surface laid, European settlers arrived armed with the geometric surface, the geometric line, the hydrologic cycle and the language of landscape. Four weapons that have proved far more effective and enduring than guns, germs, and steel. And finally, before these settlers arrived to claim land, the geometric surface, the geometric line, the hydrologic cycle, and the language of landscape were invented. And I suspect this goes back, at least in my speculative thinking, to the school of Miletus in 600 BC. Awareness that rivers exist by design and choice is all the more urgent today, given that these weapons are in trouble from climate change. With sea levels rising, rivers flooding, predictions failing, storms more frequent and violent, and glaciers melting. In short, water is having its own Me Too moment. So when I journey the Chicago tomorrow, I will do so as Anu and I have done in all our projects, namely with two imaginations. One will be on a river, the other will be in an ocean of wetness. I will do this because we have always believed that if we liberate water from its oppression by land, we will also liberate people oppressed by those who have acquired power on the basis of land. As it turns out today with climate change, it promises to liberate us all. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. This is, is a what a terrible burden. Well, first of all, thank you, Dylan, for an amazing, um, nourishing talk. Right, we can kind of like feel the water rising through us um, for this replenishment. But what like a completely intimidating thing to have to show a PowerPoint after a designer and an artist. Um, I mean, I'm just going to admit that right now. Um, uh, maybe turn the lights up because uh, <laughs> uh, these slides really uh, pale in comparison, both in their design 
and their conceptualization. Um, but that said, what what a pleasure to get to be together. And uh, Sabina and Carlo, thank you so much for convening us. Aaron, for being uh, our interlocutor. Uh, Jennifer, it seems very full circle because, of course, we met on an endeavor um, around and in uh, the Mississippi and its wetness. So it's kind of wonderful to see how this dialogue has taken uh, shape. And um, and Becky Lyons, who came from uh, Friends of the Chicago River, is also a partner of mine and the other people in the Freshwater Lab in a project that's called the Backward River that has both, uh, it also exists on two planes, um, ongoing live events and convenings and a digital storytelling site. And so although... Um, Jennifer tasked me to think about rivers, the Chicago, the Seine, my work on the Jordan. Um, I found myself um, kind of channelized um, into the local to speak about uh, the Chicago, but I hope afterwards we'll have a chance to think about um, rivers multiple and in their multiple forms. So recent MacArthur Award winner Ling Ma's novel Severance is a post-apocalyptic love letter to the city. Like many a protagonist in apocalypse fiction, Candace finds herself pregnant at the end of the world, holding a future in her body while assessing the remnant elements that might support it. At first, she finds a manner of isolated workaday stability in an empty New York City, but a hijacked cab ride lands her in the cultish band of a man named Bob, who moves the group to a mall in suburban Illinois. Once again, Candace must escape, and the novel portends restoration when she makes it to Chicago. Her escape car out of gas, she cites, quote, a massive littered river planked by an elaborate wrought iron bridge. The bridge suggests a human scale. So Candace exits the car and walks across the river, symbolizing return to a reciprocal relationship with an urban ecosystem. Redolent with myth, the crossing marks a homecoming, a fulfilling transformation, a threshold of safety. The river epitomizes the city, flowing still with its terminated history. Rivers, in particular the Chicago forced backward as an industrial channel, enclose and enforce urban history. The sustainability and the problematics of the term river will, con will concern us throughout our time together and beyond. So allow me to focus on the word history, which I purposely keep singular due to the ways that urban river infrastructure freezes certain premises in concrete and metal. The premises largely derive from the 19th century onset of the industrial age, or as Andreas Malm calls it, the age of fossil capital. The fact that infrastructure reflects ideologies from the time of its design and construction can be fascinating in its particular instantiations, but it also holds true for all built objects, so it's a little bit less interesting. An additional level of analysis can show how continued use of infrastructure activates and perpetuates ideologies in ways that direct and constrain their horizons, much like the pumps and walls of urban rivers. The tectonic origins of river infrastructure establish path dependence in which 19th century distributions of benefit and harm persist in the projects that repair and reinforce it. As 20th and 21st century extensions prop up early urban systems through increasingly elaborate and expensive means, rivers become fixed in ways both antiquated and dangerous. 
Furthermore, the ongoing reinforcement of industrialized water bodies creates a strange temporality in which the built environment upholds outdated conceptions exactly as the climactic events of the fossil fuel age demand new approaches. Uh, let's have a look at Alexis Rockman's um, painting, Watershed, from the Great Lake Cycle, which depicts pastoral holdover through river preservation that aesthetically values animals and plant species that require wetlands in order to live, like herons, carner's blue butterfly, and the western painted turtle, while categorically, right, kind of two planes here, Dilip, perhaps, uh, while categorically distinguishing them from genetically modified and crossbred species whose growth requires manufactured input and whose wastes render rivers as fetid channels with encroaching dead zones. Can see, even as blue-green algae and pig salmonella migrate and suck the oxygen, beginning to choke the numerous species beneath the surface of the visibly healthy ecosystem, the landscape depicts and ironizes the notion that urban wastes abide by limits that preserve a peaceful refuge outside of systems of production and surveillance. Rockman's painting almost anticipates the recent U.S. Supreme Court ruling in Sackett versus the Environmental Protection Agency that slashed wetland protections under the non-scientific premise that smaller water bodies can be sacrificed, severed from the ecosystem, and given over to infill and development. Through its title, Watershed, the painting overrides attempts to distinguish between canals and rivers and shows how piped inputs and runoff industrialize the entire system. Infrastructural recapitulation of the industrial age with its carbon excesses and celebration of garden cities long after the expiration of its promises exerts a tightening chokehold. If I may speak in general terms for a moment longer, then allow me to enumerate some of the conceptualizations embedded in water infrastructure. In the rest of my time, I'll work to support these claims through the example of the Chicago River. And again, I hope that our discussion might open to the ways that other water bodies and infrastructures present supporting and qualifying evidence. The ideas behind the canals and channelized rivers of the 19th century include a drive to dispossess indigenous peoples perceived as an impediment to the desired speed of extraction, production, and exchange. And achieving such speed involves straightening, deepening, and widening, river, widening rivers to accommodate enabling vessels. As commercial boats and barges, ferry raw materials and manufactured commodities, pipes link factories to water in order to give outlet to their wastes. The moment they enter pipes and drains, these wastes no longer belong to the producers, but to the public. As their concentrations increase and pose threats to public health, municipal governments over time devote themselves to curbing the harms through applications of public funding. The resulting infrastructure embeds allowances for industry to pursue a horizon of endless growth with the public always picking up the tab for mounting waste. To this day, however dramatic the deleterious inputs and diversions that support commercial growth, they tend to be occluded through an optics that paradoxically renders complex interventions invisible or celebrated as the March of Progress. 
The Industrial Age enlisted water along with railroads and pipelines as vectors for commodities, which meant that its flow gained new characteristics of directionality. This directionality involves designation of places to be spared the onslaught of wastes and others to be inundated by them based on created categories of class, race, and ethnicity. And in this way, water geographies map social divisions. Let us turn to the Chicago River, which meandered in its pre-industrial form from northern and southern sources. All these words have been qualified, though, Dilip, I don't know, source, which meandered from north and south uh, through a vast wetland then met at a central point before looping around a sand spit and draining into Lake Michigan. Indigenous peoples claimed the zone where prairie morphed into water, inhabited it, and plied the waters for migration, trade, and gathering. Famously, in the 17th century, Indigenous locals showed the colonial travelers Louis Joliet and Jacques Marquette how to portage through Mud Lake. And this is a contemporary statue that marks the point. I see some smiles. Um, subsequent field trip is in order. Uh, uh, that showed uh, the colonial travelers how to portage through Mud Lake, the shortest crossing between the Des Plaines and Chicago rivers, which appeared to the French speakers as a future trade link between the Mississippi River and the Great Lakes watersheds. Their vision manifested with the opening of the Illinois and Michigan Canal in 1848 that turned three rivers into a 96-mile canal centering Chicago as a manufacturing mecca. As factories lined the canal, particularly meat packing at a feeding tributary, let us go, that gained the name Bubbly Creek due to the methane bubbles from animal carcasses um, wastes flowed into Lake Michigan, polluting the drinking water and causing epidemics. Never did the city fathers think to tell the factory owners, and sometimes they were one in the same, to scale down production, reduce their contaminating inputs, or pay to deal with their byproducts. Instead, publicly funded geoengineering supported the wager that waste could be circumvented. Chicago municipal government first tried to overshoot pollution by laying intake pipes two miles from the Lake Michigan shore. Set in birthday cake looking structures called cribs, Pumps, and this, this still operates, these cribs, most of them. Um, they're, they're all still there, and most of them still operate. Um, pumps send water to the shore that then and now everyone wished would bear no traces of its tributary river. The wish ran counter to the nature of currents. The next attempt to keep drinking water separate from the urban wash involved lifting the city to install sewers. However, because the sewer pipes ultimately emptied into the river slash canal, a distinction between drinking water and waste proved elusive. Hope remained invested in a great man, Alice Sylvester Chesbro vested with the power to, quote, promote unrestricted urban growth and free the city from the, quote, limitations imposed by an unfavorable natural topography. Chesbro noticed how during especially high influxes of waste and stormwater into the south branch of the Chicago River, water could move backward into the Illinois and Michigan Canal rather than draining out to the lake. 
the slippage illustrated the possibility of redirecting unwanted flows beyond the boundaries of the city. Without much fanfare, Chesbro decided to deepen the canal and position pumps to direct the river's current away from the lake. Believing the industrial waste problem to be solved, Chicago experienced additional growth and with attendant waste streams that counteracted the force of Chesbro's pumps. A more significant feat of engineering was needed to impose industrial imperatives upon the water. The great man's authority to reverse geography and, and creation became reinforced by a new governmental agency of elected commissioners, the Sanitary District of Chicago. And they are elected, of course, because they work through taxation. Uh, animated by Chesbro's vision, the Sanitary District oversaw the turning of the Chicago River backward so that it drew from Lake Michigan to gain force and dilutive power to move metropolitan wastes southward to the Des Plaines, Illinois, and Mississippi rivers, and ultimately out to the Gulf of Mexico. At the very beginning of the 20th century, in fact, the very first day, a disciplined Chicago River was reborn as the Sanitary and Ship Canal, where once it fed Lake Michigan, now a giant garage door allowed it to draw lake water, pull it past a growing downtown and the factories that paid its rents, and pump it into the Mississippi River Basin. In liquid capital making the Chicago waterfront, Joshua Salzman speaks of river reversal and the attendant development of its banks as a new ecology created for a new urban industrial capitalism. This continent spanning plumbing, in essence, functions as the world's biggest toilet. However concealed by the pastoral images preserved by the name Chicago River, the moniker Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal admits to the purpose, the purposes of redirecting waste and facilitating transfer of materials and commodities on barges, along with the elected sanitary district, later named the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, the Army Corps of Engineers oversees the water's sanitary and shipping purposes and looks to overcome any barriers to them. After the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal survived St. Louis's suit to the U.S. Supreme Court, river reversal became the rage and market relations gained further expression in river design. Chicago's North Branch narrowed into the sewage-laden North Shore Channel in 1910, and the Calumet River bore the industrial brunt as the Cal Sag Channel from 1922. With the locks, pumps, and hard edges that move them, the branches of the river comprise the Chicago area waterway system. The singular system upholds dramatic distinctions among northern reaches, largely upheld as riverine and lined by high-value real estate, a main branch intertwined with a changing downtown and the southern forks where industry persists and deindustrialized patches are converted to warehousing or waste transfer. Although also unequal in its impacts, overflow conjoins the system. Ironically, the grandiose feat of Chicago's wastewater transfer was underbuilt even when it opened. Sewers resemble highways in that increasing capacity leads to increased use. Chesbro's original design, which largely defines the Chicago metropolitan area, involves combined sewers where drains from homes and factories meet underground with the storm drains from the street. 
both increased water use and spikes in precipitation can fill up the sewer system with the effects of the wash rising to the surface and or spewing out into the river. Each return of the repressed water overwhelms the city in a different way. When copious liquid pours into the waterway system, it can elevate the river above the level of the lake and cause spillage that undoes the original intent of the canal. This flaw in the system enacts a kind of sewer's revenge in which the wastes directed into the canal make their way into the source of drinking water. Its recurrence has not inspired reevaluation of the sanitary and ship canal, but rather additional geoengineering that locks its operation in place. Uh, outfall pipes that pour untreated water into the waterway system during floods remain in place until today. Following the introduction of wastewater treatment to the waterway system, combined sewers sent water to treatment plants that subsequently released treated wastewater to flow southward. But when the combined sewers brought in too much water, treatment plants also faced the problem of inundation met by directing untreated water back into the river, often imperiling the lake. The solution to backups in the world's biggest toilet was another installation of gargantuan infrastructure a massive holding tank called the Tunnel and Reservoir Project TARP, or Deep Tunnel. Designed in 1960 with precipitation statistics from the 1940s, construction of the world's biggest deep tunnel began in 1972, just before the precipitous drop in federal funding for water infrastructure. So its scale is about the amount of water, but it's also about this kind of last gasp of uh, federal funding for um, water infrastructure that completely dried up uh, until the 2021 Infrastructure Act. In as much as Chicago's tunnel and reservoir project shores up operation of the 19th century sanitary and ship canal, its scale reflects the mid 20th century optimism uh, at the time of its design. TARP includes 109 miles of underground caverns and three gaping quarries turned into reservoirs. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers plans to have a fourth and final quarry in operation by 2029, a mere 45 years behind schedule, uh, <laughs> at which time it will hold uh, about 11 billion gallons of water. Despite its scale and $4 billion price tag, the deep tunnel lurks like a dirty secret about which few people know. By holding billions of gallons of, wa of, wa of water during times of heavy rain and staggering its arrival at treatment plants, TARP keeps Chicago above water and prevents hundreds of millions of dollars and health emergencies from flood damage. Without it, there is simply no scenario in which Chicago could continue as it is. However, because it was created with retrospective intent to support operation of the sanitary and ship canal, several aspects of TARP remain out of sync with the present. Since the 1990s, precipitation in the region has increased by 9%, meaning that TARP's enormous holding capacity often falls short. Furthermore, pipes that feed the various tunnels and reservoirs are localized, so an empty reservoir in one part of town can do nothing to alleviate spill from another. Overflow still pours into the river and can um, seep into the lake. 
during the dramatic July 2023 rain events, for example, the river was re-reversed to prevent additional uh, urban flooding. By capitulating, by recapitulating the status quo produced by the sanitary and ship canal, the deep tunnel exerts its biggest flaw, costly storage and treatment of water designated as waste. Um, defining billions of gallons of fresh water that comes from precipitation and from drains as worthless engenders problems as well as some backward thinking. Due to the nitrogen and phosphorus that infuse water mixed with human waste, the sanitary and ship canal contributes to a New Jersey-sized dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Sustaining the notion that there is an accommodating a way where waste can go means that the contaminants in the water often go unexamined with the producers off the hook for their regulatory exceedances. Regulation and enforcement are also hobbled by acts that treat varying inputs as collective waste. Were there no construction of a dump for metropolitan effluent, then the very category of wastewater would need to undergo examination. In this way, the hiding in plain sight of the gargantuan tarp enables strange lapses in policy. Exactly as, a bill, as billions of gallons of fresh water are sent to their death in the saline Gulf of Mexico, Illinois, like most regions in the United States, is in the throes of a groundwater drawdown that pushes its largest aquifers to the point of collapse. Reuse, rather than offshoring of the treated water, presents a viable alternative. On the sanitary side, we're left asking, sanitary for whom? Certainly not neighborhoods in the industrial corridors along the South Branch, the Calumet, and the canals, which tend to correspond with the sites of the most severe combined sewer overflow and with low-income communities of color. Those traveling down the river tomorrow will see evidence of how 19th century practices of concentrating production and wastes in these riverfront neighborhoods cuts residents off from access and facilitates the siting of metal scrapping and waste storage. Reiteration of such inequities does not come with reverence for history. For example, for example, uh, the majestic Damon Silos, once celebrated by poet Carl Sandburg for making Chicago a, quote, stacker of wheat, have been sold to the scion of Chicago asphalt production, whose most recent asphalt plant exceeds the limits of its air quality permits. He has made his intent to remove the hulking concrete structure, but refuses to reveal his plans for what will replace it or any safeguards to accompany his proposed demolition. The ship aspect of the canal generates additional levels of paradox. Once upon a time, shipping included grain, timber, and metals. More recently, its cargo is largely comprised of fossil fuels with petroleum products increasingly replacing coal. Due to its cargo, as Jennifer mentioned, I have come to view the Chicago area waterway system like a network of oil pipelines in which barges resemble the packets of energy pumped through privately controlled channels. Um, this is uh, Corey uh, Hagelsberg, a Calumet area artist, uh, agrees with me. He also came up uh, with this version of the river as a pipeline before we even talked. Uh, the fact that the Chicago area waterway system, along with the rivers to which it connects, runs on public funding, make the barge and energy industries the privileged private users of a publicly funded pipeline network. The fusion 
of watersheds in the name of international shipping enables many kinds of natural and cultural mixtures. And part of the mix comes from living travelers uh, on ships from far-flung ports that disembark and find success in a new place. When the species in question outcompetes its predecessors, then it becomes classified as invasive. Although I prefer to shift agency where it is due and call these species introduced. There are an estimated 188 non-native species in the Great Lakes Basin, with roughly a third of those defined as invasive or introduced. The most formidable are four kinds of carp. Their movement has brought Great Lakes states as close as they have ever come to plugging the sanitary and ship canal. Unlike other new arrivals, the carp reached the United States through the mail rather than on barges, ordered from Malaysia to clean pond scum in Arkansas. This attractive asset ultimately proved their greatest liability. Two of the four carp, Big Head and Silver, take a vacuum cleaner approach to nutrition and inhale all the plankton that they can. Plankton rests at the base of the aquatic food chain, so in its absence, smaller species go hungry and starve out bigger ones like fish, um, like beloved fish. But it wasn't the ravenousness of the carp that sees public attention, but their ability to leap from the water when fr frightened by motorboats, sometimes whacking boaters on the head. As a result, the term invader really stuck and wanted signs targeting carp established total opposition. Dubbing them Asian carp infused the standoff with long-held Rust Belt resentments about Japanese cars and Chinese manufacturer blamed for erasing blue-collar jobs. With an enemy framed in the crosshairs, it wasn't long before the military stepped in. As a wing of the armed forces, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers thinks in terms of elimination and deterrence. It has experimented with mass carp poisoning, but ultimately prefers walls in water aimed at keeping them out of the Great Lakes. U.S. ACE's solution overruns a billion dollars, contains inevitable design flaws, and keeps us lodged in a faltering 19th century system uh, overlaid with uh, xenophobia. Uh, U.S. ACE intends to expand a deterrence complex in the Mississippi-bound Des Plaines River that resembles a checkpoint for carp. Just as military checkpoints look to keep certain people in, but let others through, so the carp checkpoint, we got to the Jordan somehow, right? Uh, so the carp checkpoint aims to repel particular fish and propel barges. Just as military checkpoints have increased surveillance and detention technologies, so U.S. ACE looks to do for carp. Um, so here I can take you through it after, but basically um, uh, in 2002, the first barrier of the checkpoint came up. Um, others followed in 2008, 2009, and um, 2011. And these barriers work by emitting a field of electrodes across the breadth and depth um, of the river that carp can't pass. And there's some concern about this potent charge and what does it do to the people working on barges for whom we are allegedly continuing to subsidize this system, um, right? At least the rhetoric is that um, of uh, jobs. But the basin bridging fish, uh, inspired bipartisan action among Great Lakes members of Congress who demanded federal funding for an elaborate carp deterrent. For a total cost of close to $1 billion, the carp checkpoint uh, will increase the redundancy of current barriers by adding more, along with an acoustic deterrent blasting sounds and a bubble curtain that, quote, removes small fish and stunned fish 
entrained in spaces between barges. Uh, this project received $226 million uh, for in the uh, Infrastructure Act for the completion of pre-construction engineering and um, design, additional federal funding from the Great Lakes Restoration, and around $40 million from the states of Michigan and Illinois back up the impressive um, starting sum. Likely, the rapidity of species migration and the delay associated with mammoth infrastructure may still turn out to be woefully um, out of sync. And again, let me just uh, say something. I'm yeah, sometimes, and we can talk about it after. People are like, "Are you saying let the carp in?" And what does this mean um, for fish? Um, we can talk about that. But what I want to focus on here is how the fear tracking the CART movement and its overlay with current immigration um, rhetoric produce the wrong set of solutions. Um, media heighten the sense that we are at war with this fish, which triggers military solutions like the one you see um, on um, the slide. And perhaps more disorienting, this rhetoric directs us to the symptom and not the cause as if plants and animals conspired to overtake ecosystems rather than being carried along routes of exchange. The talk of infestation, bioinvasion, and demographic threat obscures the fact that um, the public facilitates their travel and that the back end of global capitalism teems with life. Meanwhile, the direct and indirect cost of the 19th century sanitary and ship canal mount around 1.7 billion to keep it running another billion to keep out carp as warming boosts precipitation rates and floods monetary and personal costs multiply in the words of andreas malm the climate crisis unfolds through a series of interlocked absurdities ingrained in it when might the absurdities be evaluated as such? At what point will it simply be too costly to keep the 19th century canal running? What kind of reframing is necessary to perceive the contents of the deep tunnel stored and treated on the public dime as vital water rather than waste? And so as much as I want to open ideas of water free from the inexorable push of the status quo, I find that my own are still channeled by existing infrastructure. I still find myself thinking within the pipe. Uh, and that Ling Ma represents the Chicago River as it is at the end of the world, further supports these inclinations. This means that I neither entertain apocalyptic hopes that um, it's curtailing or it's crumbling will once and for all foreclose standard operating procedures, nor do I envision some kind of like bucolic return to pre-industrial forms. Instead, I endeavor to address the repeated outcomes of reinforcing industrial age infrastructure as a means of reconceiving its design. At the system level, the deep tunnel no longer makes sense. Uh, to store water, treat it to its regulatory limits, then send it away in an era of debilitating droughts. Rather, than dedicating billions to operating the waterway system and establishing a checkpoint for CARP, these funds, I think, should be directed in classic Chicago style that has the world's biggest everything when it comes to water infrastructure to the world's largest water recycling program. The canal can take actual form in its metaphoric identity by becoming a series of pipes that convey water rather than petrochemicals to sites of heavy industrial use. Just as 19th century transformations of rivers created vectors of waste, so its scales of extraction have emptied aquifers of their ancient water. 
survival in the 21st century will depend upon the redefinition of wastewater and its application in places that have tapped their water sources. Such is the case with the Illinois city, named after the French-Canadian explorer Joliet, who first uh, portaged over Mud Lake. Um, uh, the city of Joliet has aquifer levels that have plummeted by over 800 feet. Incidentally, it is the very uh, site of the CARP checkpoint. So right here, they're in a groundwater emergency. They've been tasked with finding a new source of water, but um, the copious federal funding is going into the checkpoint technology. So in conjunction with the water recycling, a circular system can redefine the things that we send away, not as waste, but as a set of usable um usable items and harvesting and reusing this waste can prevent the blooms which cause dead zones and can help um, create public revenue to go back in to um, public coffers. Um, so, right, with the kind of an ongoing um, feedback loop, of wastes and water, erasing that line between them, the public sector could derive benefit from its yield. So uh, to close, with the multiple challenges posed by climate change and the worse than negligible contributions of private industry to mitigation and resiliency, the time has come to set higher rates for industrial water use and to devote public dollars to public well-being. Insofar as the public in question shoulders different degrees of exposure to industrial waste and experiences of flooding, monies loosened from corporate subsidies should be invested at higher rates in frontline and environmental justice communities. Where the 19th century persists in hard edges and concrete clashes of land and water, the nature of 21st century rain that falls and bursts that follow long absences requires the involvement of plants with the ability to hold, filter, and retain water. Where transformations at the scale of waterways and deep tunnels require organizing policy and system change, enlisting plants to help meet the floods can transpire concurrently at many scales as a means of remembering the Chicago wetlands and urban design. There remain futures that can be seeded in ways other than concrete and metal even post-industrial water can help them to grow. Thank you. When Ryan's sticking around for another 15 minutes or so, we're gonna have a uh, conversation with Aaron and have a couple questions and then we'll head to the reception in the back. Sure. Whoops. Still um okay and and also we should just say like we're a little bit over time so uh you know anyone who need, needs to go can flow drip or flow out that's uh uh, as needed. So um, first, I just I want to um, thank both both of our speakers. I, I said to both of them uh, before we started that I I spent the day uh, like variously immersed in their in their work and have just been struck um, all day long by how already um, the the subversive, creative, conceptual vocabularies and and maneuvers that they're working with are, are causing me to sort of see even this uh, localized subset of this uh, urban environment that we're we're thinking about together um, differently. And it, it just it, it strikes me that there's um, so so much that can be generated out of this conversation. And I'm, I'm already full of regret that I'm not going to be able to join you all um, tomorrow because I 
I can sort of I'm starting to see the, the city differently because of both of you. Um, so I'm I'm a historian and and found that as I was um, reading and thinking with both of your work, I was thinking about um, sort of where and how you're you're locating yourselves in in time. Um, and I guess I'd start by um, uh, I mean I was struck in thinking about um, both of your recent work that. Um, Dilip, you're you're thinking about the set of conceptual problems on a scale that is, um, from the perspective of a, of a historian, like truly dazzling uh, in its uh, in its scale. You're spanning several thousand years um, of of the accretions of this. Um, uh, I mean, conceptual frame and and ways of designing and and creating rivers. Um, and Rachel, your your often a bit more comfortably in in terrain that uh is as at a, a temporal scale that um that i'm used to working with but um sort of towards the end i was thinking about the fact that um some of your future oriented comments are suggesting that the the water that we're dealing with right now might really be very different than the water uh that that people were starting to to, to contain and manage um uh, at the at the dawn of the creation of rivers, and so I thought I would start by asking you, Dilip, sort of whether, um, you know, in in what ways it might um, make sense, uh, if at all, to kind of think about the historical mutability of the wetness that you're describing, whether uh, the kinds of pollution and and transformation of the and use of the water that um, uh, Rachel is thinking about here in this more localized way um might might require us to kind of think about the ocean as something different now than it was um at, you know at the moment that Gunga started to become the Ganges or um yeah so I'll start there okay well thanks Rachel for that uh bringing us down to earth in some way <laughs> <laughs> yeah well let's say bringing us down to water in some way um I mean one of the things that uh, I mean I think the way you ended I think you know, with the sense of, with the sense of hope, in terms of in terms of holding. I mean, I saw all the landscapes that you list over there, um, as you know, as sort of landscapes of holdings. And one of the things that I have learned actually over the, you know, I mean, working in multiple places, multiple places, is that we can only go that far with the language of holding water. You know, and so I find that I mean, like in a place like in a place like India, many of these projects are prevented because you know it is going to take away water from rivers. So they, I mean, and I've heard I've heard about this actually even in Santa Fe, you know, where when there was a competition at one time, and um, and you know I learned that you cannot hold in Santa Fe because the water by a Spanish treaty is promised to the Rio Grande in Texas. You know, and so there is this structuring, there's a structuring of water infrastructure that somehow continues in these interventions that you're talking about at the end. And so this is what sort of led us to the fact that water is an obstacle to, to new projects like that. And if we can release ourselves from water and start thinking about rain, to some extent, I'm less interested in the history aspect of it and more interested as a designer in the possibility of it. You know, and so when I think of, you know, going to a government official and telling them that this is an approach to take, I mean, as I've done so often in, in, in you know, with, with civil servants in India, you know, they ask you two questions. The first question is, has this been tried anywhere else? You know, and then of course now I've got the Chicago example. I think which could be just fantastic. Um, but then you know, the second the second question is that when you when you present projects like this, they say, oh, but it's so rural. It's not urban. You know, we can't put it in the city because again they are so confined to the engineering imagination and water thinking. So to get them out of water thinking. You know, and you know, rather than get into wetness, sometimes I say that think of of rain, think of fog, think of you know all the stuff as we're holding. I mean, there's enough water 
you know, in the air, you know, then, you know, more, more than is in the ground, perhaps, you know, and we're only realizing it now just because we don't see it, you know, and I'm working with cultures who are so aware, actually, of this, of this, we didn't need any proof in a place like India, for example, that there was enough water in rain to supply rivers. But yet for 2000 years, people were not convinced that rain was enough for rivers. So they had this whole scheme, hydrological scheme of water coming through the earth. You know, and so you see medieval maps, I mean, they all show pipes going into the earth. So you are always going to second source because first source was paradise, you know, and, and beyond reach. But this is again, thinking water, water, water. So the moment you start thinking rain, which is sort of beyond imagination, which is our concern here, you know, is how do you bring these other situations of, of I don't know, you know, fog and things like that as situations that don't require water imagination. So to take us out of that, I mean, it's more for possibility than rather, you know, rather than history. Yeah. And, uh, and I feel that, you know, and to convince, of course, people like these civil servants that I deal with, you know, that they just cannot. Don't imagine. ask you how much will it cost? I, I was convinced the okay. first question, at least that's the United States first question. Well, how much will it cost? It is a question, okay. but it strangely works the other way around. The more expensive the project, the more you might get a chance to implement it. Yeah, you know? <laughs> because of kickbacks, you know, but uh, yeah. So, so, yeah, it's very strange. It's just the opposite. <laughs> You know, but they do ask that oh, question. Okay. You know, the first they... question is always, what will cost? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I'll I'll pivot from there. I, I have a sort of related question for you, Rachel, and then I think we should use the little bit of time we have left to take some questions from the audience. So, so I mean, along these lines, right? You, I mean, you you kind of. Um, uh, modestly at several points gestured at the ways in which you are you are still thinking with the river as a river um, inside the project and yet there are all sorts of places where that's not what you're doing and um uh and you know there's an interesting commonality um, between your projects and the way that you're seeing possibilities in um kind of animating and thinking with other moments in the hydrological um, cycles as, as, as ways of um, thinking through possibilities. And so um, uh, my question for you is sort of to, to what extent um, sort of outside of uh, academic circles as somebody who's working in the city, you, you've found ways in which like people in the, in in the city who might need to be mobilized around these kinds of projects are kind of willing to go there and and what that looks like. In other words, I mean, I think we can all see what, what this does conceptually, but there are kind of massive political projects that would need to be um, mobilized, um, you know, against the, the powers of urban capital to, to do these things. And so I'm wondering what, what that kind of looks like on the ground and the textures of urban politics that you're seeing. Yeah, on, the, on the one hand, I don't know if other people feel this, but it's like, I wish I could kind of go to grad school again. Like I thought, you know what I mean? You train for one thing and then the world becomes something else. So yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. Um, but um, yeah, so I, I sort of wish like I could go learn uh, again how to do this, but it's on the fly. And just to, to jump up from what Dilip was saying about getting people out of water thinking, you know, for here, it's getting us out of waste thinking. Right, because when you said actually thinking about rain, because remember those combined sewers I showed you, that's all the rain and all the water that's used and it gets mixed together. And then in that way, you know, almost the minute that it leaves, you know, the constructed surface and goes into the pipes, like the rain becomes waste. You know, we don't see it again here unless it, it all, you know, unless it's a sewer's revenge. So like the word, you know, for me, the haunting word is like waste. And, you know, sometimes when I take the oil pipeline metaphor really far, I think you've got an oil pipeline that is sourcing fields that are deemed unproductive. Like, can you imagine, you know, an oil corporation developing all of these oil fields and then paying to send it, but it's waste? I mean, so like the deep tunnel you know, makes all of this water into waste. So that's waste is like my, the, the word that that haunts me. And so, yeah, actually getting this done. Um, it's funny because optics are again a problem. 
And the, one of the, the optics that's a problem is people look out at Lake Michigan that anyone in this area is so lucky to be able to do. And its vastness works against the idea of things like conservation, not to mention reuse. You know, because again, they're like, that's is in the story I hope to convey, right? That becomes the water that's valued and the it becomes the source, right? And it's the one we drink and it's the one we care about. So get all this other mixture, keep it far away. And so it also produces an incorrect optics of abundance because, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court in that same fight over the Chicago River set an allocation limit for Illinois. It's more than any other state is allowed. It's like completely Chicago, you know, bullying. Um, but um, there is a limit and allocations, whether to cities like Joliet or to data centers or to this big quantum project that's on the horizon down here, you know, these allocations are being made without any sense of limit. So it's a, it's a, you know, I go to these meetings and I'm like, we're, you know, you make all these allocations, like we're coming up against the limit and uh, it's quite hard for many people to accept the limitation. But, I, but back to the question the civil servants ask you, luckily water reuse is alive and well in California. They started um, reusing water for industry in the Los Angeles area in 1992, which is what I want to do here in Chicago. Actually, I'm, I'm with the people keep the lake for drinking, give this um, for non-potable purposes. But, you know, now California is moving to just like completely pulling the categories. Like there's not going to be rain and waste and drinking water anymore. There's, you know, what they call one water. So that's helpful. But um, it is. It, it also creates this kind of paradoxical reality where the same officials are ready to make all these allocations and keep subsidizing the same old bandits. And then when you show up and say, well, we've got to like protect the, you know, the amount of water or expand it. It, it's it's like I'm speaking like it's magical thinking. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, yeah, so there it is. But it has there's no other way that I that there's no other way this can go ultimately. So I guess the question, you know, becomes, do we spend all this money on bizarre infrastructure that we don't need and won't work or. You know, and I, I fought that battle when it could be fought, but after it was bipartisan and, you know, went in the Infrastructure Act. I mean, they'll probably mess it up and maybe that money will be available then. But um, there there still is an inexorable status quo. And I'm still, you know, not alone with an amazing group of people trying to figure out how you articulate, you know, the backward to the future. What what is like not only the correct language but the pers the uh, persuasive language. All right. Why don't we take a kind of cluster of questions and then I'll let both of you respond to them as you see fit, and then we can go have some refreshments and talk some more. Yeah. Sorry. Here, Why don't I just? Um, so I have a couple of thoughts. Um, I usually come to these talks thinking that, you know, there might be some some hope in some way. And then I end up not having that hope. So I'm I'm extremely pessimistic um, at this point, because I think the way to actually do it is what Dilip is saying, you know, just like think about, like, just forget about these kind of boundaries and surfaces and um, artificial um, holdings. But the reality is what uh, what uh, you are going to work with, right? So, but there are a lot of all these entanglement. First of all, we are all in this, right? We can never accept that we go out, we get flooded. You know, I was just thinking of how as a child, uh, it was very easy for me and com comfortable 
and acceptable to go out and in the, during the rain when the water was coming up and down because I was raised in a flat land area where you get flooded and then we were soaked completely and then we came back and that was the life right but right now none of us can actually tolerate being wet for half an hour so this the problem is so big from the individual level of not not um being used to living in that kind of really extreme conditions of drought and water and from the fact that in industrial uh problem is 90 percent of the problem and whatever us as citizens do in preserving and in sewage is not more than um, it's just a fraction of the problem and the problem comes with the growth and then we have the same situation in university recently we have this um, uh, what is that energy institute for growth which is the same nonsense idea that we can keep engineering and then keep fixing our problems um, and I, I, sorry, I'm just ranting more and more, but like, as I also, I have a problem with um, the American situation because usually the back story is the Native American low population situation where you could not see the impact of human at a huge scale. But if you go to the Middle East, it's the entire history is these cycles of expansion and growth and then failing, failed engineering. Um, and the reason why American engineers were interested in that just going and checking those empires and trying to learn from their mistakes so that we don't fail here right but ultimately everyone fails in my opinion <laughs> sorry it's just not question but a lot of kind of pessimism and doubts and um my own personal grappling with this problem So oh, thank you very much. It's a question maybe out of the blue because it's coming from an historian of math. But I was just wondering, a great part of your talk was on a kind of math that was existing on the earth thinking with the surface and the line and so very specific type of mathematics. And then I was keep wondering what kind of mathematics would we need to live in the rain world? And I don't know. But uh, maybe it's worth trying to think. <laughs> okay, this is about the word waste. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of waste, um, as I understand it from the little bit of reading that I've done and exposure to thinking of, on the part of younger people in my life and friends, um, one big problem is that we want to, we don't want to acknowledge what comes out of our bodies, which we call waste, and flush it down a water system. And that is not even scientifically, as I understand it, <laughs> imperfectly, I'm sure, that is not even, that doesn't even make sense as a way to actually deal with the poop that comes out of our bodies, that if it were to be, for example, if, I don't know if this is even remotely sort of, what if every household had buckets with um, composting material in it, like sawdust, and that is where you go to the bathroom, and you naturally break down the waste that is otherwise going from millions of people just down a water, down the water. <laughs> Um, that is not sustainable, really. And um, I just want to put that out there. Yes, as we <laughs> proceed to our refreshments. <laughs> um, I think that's it. Yeah, why don't, why don't we take that trio of, I mean, I, I think it's a really generative set of questions and comments. So um, I'll, I'll leave it to both of you to wrap us up and then we can go. Does one of you want to I start. Shall I go? Sure. Yeah. Sure. That's right. I mean, like, I mean, three three sort of points. I mean, I felt that I mean, one was about the problem the problem solving approach like, that that takes us down a track, uh, and and I feel there that it really comes from object what I call object thinking, and water is an object. Wetness to me is not an object, you know, and it allows it allows for a certain a certain open it op open endedness. But this object thinking that drives us down, you know, the problem solving approach is precisely what sort of led us away uh, from, 
you know, from just being stuck with rivers. Yeah? And because rivers are intrinsically, you know, defined wetness as land is. So, so we've constructed a binary, constructed a binary, and this binary is also carried into waste. See, waste cannot exist without the understanding of a resource. So water, precisely because it is a resource, creates waste, you know, when it is contaminated or whether, you know, when it comes out of this, uh, you know, this ground, I mean, you say, you know, it just, I mean, We've seen it in Bombay, for example. It's a fantastic amount of rain that falls in this national forest that is in the middle, in the middle of Bombay, is then, you know, sort of released into these drains. I mean, that go right past all these settlements, you know, that uh, that don't I mean, and we ask these people, actually, don't you want to use this water that you, you know? And they said, no, government supplies us. You see, which is which is something then that also underlies, I feel, this objectness, and particularly with rivers. Rivers take us down a centralizing, a centralizing path. You know, so so when I'm looking at, for example, Santa Fe is not able to do local, you know, harvesting, precisely because it is promised to a centralized system. So I mean, I've experienced the same thing in Bangalore. You know, where they had this wonderful tank system where you had a holding of rain. Bangalore doesn't have rivers. And those pipes that I showed you, actually is going to feed, you know, like God knows how many millions of people. I mean, I'm talking about 10 to 15 million people rely on those four pipes. And they're looking now, they're searching for other sources, you know, to ship this, to ship water. But the centralizing that they are that they are doing has killed all these rain holding systems. And when I'm looking at, for example, the Ganges also. There was this fantastic, you know, holding in jungles. I mean, in plants that you're talking about. I mean, the jungle was a holding system, you know, and it was everywhere. The earth was a holding system. We have concreted this whole. So the Ganga, which was this widespread wetness 2,000 years ago, where people could just walk, it did not rise more than an inch, is now a river that is so contained that it rises 60 feet with the monsoon rains because nothing in the Himalayas was holding. You can imagine actually what a massive holding system that is that we have destroyed over 2,000 years. I mean, that is what the river has done. So the centralizing that you are, you know, concerned with, with waste, you know, and this decentralizing cannot be done, you know, sort of romantic to think of, of the locals now doing it, because I also believe that this is a source of social injustice, particularly in a place like India, you know, where, you know, like Gandhi wanted to get rid of untouchability. But what we've done is we have transferred this untouchability to rivers that are so polluted that they're untouchable, you know? And, and, and I believe as a designer that it was this infrastructure that created untouchability in the first place. I mean, a group of people that are just tasked with cleaning sewage, you know, and waste. And they're a community now that, I mean, it's terrible. I mean, it's never going to go away as long as we have this infrastructure. Now, coming to maps, I mean, and, uh, you know, and, uh, and and there's a lot of talk, actually, of maps that, uh, you know, uh, that use time, that use, you know, different materials. But to me, I'm very clear, actually, I'm sorry, I'm very clear that maps are a geographic term. You know, they come from viewing the Earth's surface, geography, the writing of the Earth. The writing of the Earth, I mean, you know, so geography was created, and, and, and to me, it's a bit of a villain, you know, is, has been created to safeguard the disciplining of the earth, you know, disciplining of humans to buy into the earth. And so the map came about as this, you know, writing of the earth's surface and the reading of it, making it readable. So I don't believe that map should be extended. In fact, I take issue now with the just act of representation. The act of representation is very much dictated by this understanding of object thinking, that when you construct objects, they become representable. The whole problem with rain is that it cannot be represented. And that is why, you know, when you see staining, when we do, when we do printmaking, when we do other things, we're giving up on representation and we're getting into demonstration. So when I say demonstration, I'm saying I'm speaking analogously rather than representations which speak logically. So A is to B is what a representation is. 
But for me, demonstration is A is to B as C is to D. So there's a proportionality. I mean, so I stain the sheet as maybe, you know, a farmer sees the earth soaking, you know? So I, I, I make that double correspondence as it were, you know? So analogical thinking, particularly for a designer is very different from representational thinking. So I say that map is to rivers as demonstration is to rain. So, so we, we very early realized this. I mean, it is a philosophical dilemma, you know, and I realized how much of philosophy, I mean, talk about the white, I mean, you, you know, I know you, I carry a lot of this, you know, bringing a lot of stuff in, but, but it is something, I mean, you, when, when writing the invention of rivers, I realized how much geography has dictated the way in which we see things. So, you know, when, uh, you know, and this, I mean, I always go back to this, I mean, Alfred North Whitehead, you know, famously said, you know, the philosophy is a footnote to Plato. I say, Plato is a footnote to the geographers before him, Thales and Anaximander, who started the whole geographic enterprise at the school of Miletus. They're the ones who asked the first question, why does the Nile flood? I mean, how did they create this Nile? And then they asked the Egyptians, you know, why does it flood? They just looked at them blankly. Not once did it occur to Herodotus, also who followed in the same track, you know, that the Egyptians never saw a river to begin with. They never saw anything to draw to begin with, you know, because they were analogical dwellers, not representational thinkers, you know. And so, you know, this is, I mean, this is really something that is, I mean, I, I realize deconstructing the river is to deconstruct all of philosophy, history, you know, and, and what have you. I mean, even history is written as a flow. And this, yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. It's written as a flow. Yeah. And then I asked myself, why are nomads not part of history? I mean, like, oh, we're not part of Herodotus' thing. Because he was looking for flow systems. He was he's grounded in flow systems in his surface on which he saw traces that he could track and a common ground that he could construct. A nomad doesn't believe in, you know, in a history that flows. They are carriers of their own history. So this is why I like to distinguish between past and history. They gather their past and they hold their past in them. And now we have, you know, a colonizer comes classically and says, you know, this is your past. They also say, this is your language, you know? So I'm a victim of that, you know? I know I'm partly colonized and, and, and partly, you know, a colonizer. But I know what it means, actually, for a colonizer to come to you and say that, you know, you're not a holder of history. The history that we are doing is your past, you know. So this is the way you extract the past out of people. You extract their place out of people and then situate them in the place that you want them to occupy, in the time you want them to occupy, and so on. So these are all colonial disciplines. And a map is one of the most wicked weapons, you know, that I've you know, that I've seen. I love maps, unfortunately, <laughs> you know, but you know, that's part of my education, you know, but but I know, you know, it's it's limits. So we're experimenting with this with this demonstration, but it builds community. I mean, you know, there is a lot of social justice in its construction. There is, you know, there's a lot, but, uh, but it's something we're exploring, you know, the process. I mean, that's why we do our exhibitions as public exhibitions. You know, we don't work through, you know, academia, you know, because to some extent, academ academics, to some extent, are those whom I blame for <laughs> colonization. Colonization begins with academics, actually. <laughs> I mean, this goes with, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm blaming myself and, and blaming myself and everybody else with it, you know. There's something too. I mean, I'm thinking about ancient maps, particularly the the Babylonian map of Monde. I mean, and but they they also are. Um, I don't know how you feel about this, but they're also like cosmological, right? I mean, I think about the Babylonian map of Monde, right? And the Euphrates goes into the world ocean, and right there's those triangles that jut out, and those are all the like deviants, right? They're not in the center according to that map, but like. The other thing about these depictions of rivers is that they're not terrestrial bound. They're rather the vehicles like to, you know, the transcendent world. You please. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, you have a, you have a great point there. I mean, then when I look at, for example, Homer's 
for whom is drawing sure. of Achilles yeah. and Chile. Yeah. yeah, which came from the Babylonian. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and to some extent, Thales also carried it, uh, you know, even though he was a couple of centuries yeah. after, after Homer. But when they speak of Oceanus, it's interesting to see how geographers read it. Geographers read Oceanus as a river that runs around, you know, some kind of territory that they say is a flat earth. But what these people were seeing, and I'm looking at this as a designer, mm -hmm. again, is they were seeing Oceanus in section, you know, as, as an enveloping wetness. So when they show it in a map, in a map, you know, that I, I use hesitatingly, you know, they were looking at an yeah. enveloping world. So you yeah. could look at that as a cosmological, That's, but yeah. I look at it as, I tend to look at it as material, that oh. they were looking at, at this entirety. So I feel yeah. that Thales also, when he's, you know, he's accused, or to some extent, you know, labeled as somebody who said that the earth rests on water, that's absolute nonsense. I mean, what he was saying is that earth is driven by wetness. And so, you know, in, in, in fact, even, you know, post Aristotle, it was said that, they, that the ancients, you know, entertained one more element. And that element was neither water nor air but something in between. In between, mm -hmm. yeah. That, I mean, I, that's, yeah, right. So it's like, so th it, it does what you want because the terrestrial water is also the celestial water and it's something that moves among realms and among people, I mean, like literal fluidity, you know, and constant movement. So, I, I, you know, I often... Um, like pre-industrial depictions of these things are actually like these demonstrations of the instability of categories and the deep interconnection, you know, of, of life. So, you know, I, I think it like gets moved in a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm even thinking of, um, you know, the, these like ancient ideas that, you know, there's like, there's some kind of like tunnel that rims around, you know, windows that you can look into the depths and look into the terrestrial into the rain so yeah i i i think you i think it's a certain kind of map that you might be against <laughs> and i think you might be in this other kind of tradition um yeah yeah it could be working documents as it were yeah. you know yeah in colonial it's, it's meant you can go see all the maps like in the british museum right i mean so it's like you can do one stop right <laughs> All right, I think this is probably a good moment for us to relocate, not so much stop, but I, I just want to thank both of our speakers again. So please join me in thanking uh, them. Thank you all for staying past time and we have some refreshments outside. So please uh, join us and we can continue the conversation out there. <laughs>